Hello and welcome back. I hope you had a little stretch and uh, cleared your head and are ready for the next part. I'm very happy to welcome Chen Hui Jing with us today. She's a self-taught uh, front end designer and developer living in Singapore. Hello, hello, Hinying. Thank you very much uh, for joining us at this very late hour. I think it's midnight or something <laughs> for you. Um, but uh, so Huying, actually, um, web was not your first career choice, let's say. You <laughs> were uh, <laughs> uh, a full-time basketball player and the national Malaysian team while studying uh, finance and business. So very different mindset. <laughs> Um, but uh, I understand that you got into kind of CSS and HTML building a website for, for the Malaysian f uh, Basketball Association mm -hmm. and yes. kind, of yes. kind of discovered this passion for CSS um, there and uh, never looked back, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> that is correct. So <laughs> that's wonderful. And um, I you you keep yourself busy uh, writing a lot I understand and um, talking about uh, modern web layouts and um, you know such things like the flexbox and uh, CSS grid uh, things that are a little bit foreign to me <laughs> um, but uh, fascinating nevertheless and um, uh, kind of you know you are advocating also for a change of mindset in web design, um, kind of in view of uh, this new term coined by Jim Simmons, the intrinsic web design, and uh, which seems to be, uh, well, a natural evolution from responsive design. So mm -hmm. perhaps uh, we can hear later on uh, a discussion between you and Sarah, or I would be interested what uh, Sarah thinks about this as well. Oh, definitely. And uh, currently, you are actually a, a developer at uh, Shop at the growth team at Shopify, now yes, working yes. on some internalization in the teams uh, building um, the websites, local websites. Mm -hmm. No, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So now we'll um, run your video uh, where you talk to us about uh, Asian typography on the web, and we'll uh, see you afterwards for a few more questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Type Tech Meetup folks. This is my first ever typography event, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Big thank you to the organizers for having me and giving me this opportunity to share with all of you a topic I'm particularly passionate about. So my name is Hui Jing, and I'm simple enough that these emojis paint a fairly comprehensive picture of who I am as a person. If you're unfamiliar with Chinese names, our family names come first, followed by our first names. I happen to be fluent in both English and Chinese, so when I talk a bit more about East Asian languages later in the talk, I will mostly reference Chinese. Before we get into the talk proper, where we'll be looking at what current web technologies offer for typesetting in the browser, I'd like everyone to just give a little think about information technology, since we're often said to be living in the information age right now. Information technology deals with the storage and retrieval of information, right? Extraction of higher levels of meaning from a collection of information and the transmission of information over large distances. Writing is the first information technology humans ever developed. And writing was so flexible. All you needed was a surface and something to create marks on that surface, right? Vincent Steer, founder of the British Topographers Guild, had said that the character of any alphabet is dictated by the materials used in its expression. So cuneiform writing was made using a wedge-shaped tool that was pressed into wet clay. Uh, Egyptians wrote on papyrus with a reed pen, so their lines were kind of soft and flowy. Chinese writing centered around the brush and ink, so this also informed how Han characters evolved over time. Technological advancement can generally be thought of as humanity's solution for producing more output for less effort. The advancement of information technology sought to reproduce writing at scale, from employing larger numbers of humans to copy scripts to the development of printing and digital technology. 
But with every increase in productivity, significant trade-offs were made. The techniques that won out over the course of human civilization shape how we live today. There are a huge number of factors that came into play, but what is undeniable is that modern-day digital technology suits a particular style of writing system over others. Now, I have no idea what an alternate history would look like because, you know, my reality is here and now. But it's as if you're asking a person who had been colorblind their whole life to imagine what green looked like. So science fiction writers probably do a way better job of this, but I do wonder how different our lives would be if digital technology was pioneered in a different region. So I've structured the talk broadly into three parts, uh, starting with how digital computers recognize characters and render them on the screen, how we can display them, and finally how we can lay them out in an aesthetically pleasing manner on the web. So, a bit about character encoding, right? The first standard was ASCII, or American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This was originally based on the English alphabet and developed from telegraph code. So computer architecture at the time was largely 8-bit, and ASCII encoded characters in 7 bits for the original 128 characters, which is fine. There was capacity for another 128 characters, but when countries that were outside of America started to have computers of their own, everyone started to do their own thing to cater for their own language and character requirements, right? So writing systems utilizing Han characters consist of tens of thousands of glyphs, and these were never going to fit into 8 bits. Local encoding systems like the Chinese Guobiao and the Taiwanese Big Five were then developed to handle Chinese characters. In Japan, they even created multiple systems for Japanese depending on the hardware, but these systems were not compatible with one another. And the Japanese even have a term for garbled output caused by text decoded with unintended character encoding. It's called mojibake. Even though this issue is less pronounced today with the widespread adoption of Unicode, it's not completely solved. Even Facebook sometimes doesn't display Burmese text correctly. So the recommendation from the W3C is to always save your web pages as UTF-8 and to always declare the encoding of your document via the carset attribute on meta text that go into your document's head element. So for CSS, you'd use the carset declaration at the top of your style sheet. Now every computer's operating system has a text rendering engine, which is responsible for rasterizing the font outlines for display on the screen. Browser's layout engines will defer to the operating system's text rendering engine, and if they are multiple text rendering engines, the browser can pick which one to use. This is why text looks different on Mac and Windows, and sometimes even vary on different browsers on the same machine. Electronic displays these days are high fairly high resolution, right? And But a huge majority of these screens are still raster displays. It's just that we've managed to pack way more pixels onto the screen than we used to, but they're still made up of individual discrete pixels. The earliest digital fonts were pixel-based bitmaps, which were okay for low-resolution screens, but problematic when content needed to be printed because printers were high-resolution. So PostScript was a solution that Adobe released back in 84. It was the first ever vector font format and did really well on the market. And after three decades, Adobe has recently announced that they would end support for Type 1 in January of 2023. So we've come, kind of come full circle. Typography Guru released an excellent video which takes a look back to the time period during which the industry was transitioning from bitmap to vector, so that's an interesting bit of trivia. But Apple and Microsoft weren't just going to sit there, right? They wanted to get into the game to challenge Adobe's font monopoly. So over the years, we've got lots of font formats. These are the ones that you see on the web. Currently, we're mostly seeing OpenType and WAF2 being used. So designing Chinese characters is significantly more challenging as compared to Latin-based alphabets or Arabic numerals for a number of reasons. Firstly, the sheer volume of glyphs required for just daily use alone is around 7,000. But there are about, I would say, 50,000 glyphs in existence or more. So such a monumental task, if undertaken by a single experienced designer working full-time, would probably take like at least three years to complete the 6,763 characters defined in the Chinese national standard. Now most foundries employ a team working closely together over three to five months. However, this also increases the risk of inconsistency in structure and style across such a large volume of characters designed by different people. The structure of Chinese characters is also more complex, having more than 10 strokes, more than 10 intersection points on average, if you can see in some of the screenshots. So this is also quite a challenge from a rendering perspective as well. 
Now, when the web first started, browsers could only choose between fonts that were already installed on their users' host machines. But in a revision to the CSS specification, a proposal was made to allow browsers to load fonts from an external source via URL. And this proposal was eventually made a reality when browser vendors picked it up and implemented it. To specify what font your website is using, we use a CSS property called the font family. And this has been around since the beginning. Now, for the most part, system fonts will support an extended character set covering a majority of languages, which is why the concept of font stacks mattered so much when web fonts became a thing. The order of the declared fonts makes a difference because the browser will go through the list from left to right. So ideally, your font stack should be made up of fonts that share similar characteristics, so it's not that obvious that a fallback has been invoked whenever a missing glyph is encountered. So usually the advice I'm sure all of you would have heard this before. Similar visual styles, similar X heights, similar stroke weights. System fonts come at the end because of the fallback thing. Because in the event that you don't pick a nice font stack, you're going to end up with a rather tragic situation that still happens fairly regularly, I would say, simply because I think people don't take into account characters in the extended Latin set, maybe. Um, like my friend Vadim replied on my Twitter thread when I posted this, uh, it's not lethal. No, it's nobody will die, but it is quite ugly. If a character cannot be displayed using any font at all, for example, this particularly infamous Chinese character, Biang, you'll end up with a symbol of the missing glyph, or what we endearingly call tofu characters. Sometimes you'll see a corresponding character code in a rectangle, simply a blank rectangle, but personally I see a lot less of this these days compared to a decade ago, so that's a good thing. And web fonts, they are implemented in CSS using the font phase rule, in the sense that we declare them with the font phase rule. So given the support status these days, as you can see a lot of green, we can use just WAF2 and WAF. We can get away with this, it should be fine. And there are many descriptors for declaring a web font using this at font phase rule, but only the font family and source are actually mandatory. The font family descriptor works purely like a label, so we can reference the font data via CSS. So maybe say you're using uh, Helvetica or Bilato, like in my example. You don't necessarily have to use the font names as this. You could say like dinosaur. It'll still work, no problem. The source descriptor tells the browser where to find the so uh, font data. So it could be an external URL or even a local font. Uh, this is the full set of possible descriptors. Uh, so then, And what they're used is for CSS to match them for example, if someone declares font weight bold down the line, CSS uses this to say, oh, this is the font file for bold, we'll load that, something like that. So in terms of browser tools, the Firefox font tools is the most full featured tool available right now. So how it works is that you can see which fonts are loaded on the page and which fonts are being loaded for which characters on your page. And there's also information about all the fonts on the page in the bottom section of the fonts panel, if you can see. And this tool comes in really handy, especially for those of us who build multilingual websites or even sites that just use a handful of foreign words, right? Because sometimes you might be using a typeface that does not support all the required characters. And uh, this example I pulled up here is, there's this round sans serif I kind of like called Railway. It's designed by the League of Movable Type. It's really pretty nice, I think, but unfortunately it does not support Cyrillic characters, which is a bummer if I wanted to use it for a talk I'm giving in, say, maybe Ukraine or countries that use those writing systems. So what we can do is to find a font that does contain these characters and somewhat resembles the design of the chosen font and then utilize this descriptor called Unicode Range to create a composite font. So the alternate font that I've chosen here is called Comfort AA. And what we do is we declare it in the app font phase rule as well. I call it a composite font because it mixes glyphs from different fonts for different scripts. So to deal with the fact that Railway does not support Cyrillic letters, we can use the Unicode range descriptor that I mentioned earlier to tell the browser to load Comfort AA, which is a font that does, whenever it encounters any Cyrillic characters it needs to render. For font phase rules, font family, simply a label. So what we've done here is we've essentially created a composite font that uses the name Railway, but in actuality, it loads two different font files depending on what characters need to be displayed. So back to Firefox font tools, the font highlighter reveals what the browser does whenever it encounters such a scenario. So in Railway, 
is the font family descriptor, but you can see that Firefox has loaded both Railway and Comfort AA. Uh, and the font tools can also tell you which font format the browser loaded for a particular run of text. So most CJK system fonts, which are short for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, they have very good glyph coverage. Uh, on average, this system font will come in about 20 to 30,000 glyphs. But when web fonts were introduced and it allowed developers to send fonts that were not installed on user systems over the web via URL, they, we had an issue, right? Because font data takes up bandwidth and the font data sizes are very dependent on the size of the character set supported by the font. So you can imagine with 20 to 30,000 glyphs, the font size could go up to almost like 8 to 16 megabytes. So the nature of CJK fonts make them impractical from a performance standpoint. So currently, websites in these languages almost always use system fonts. Now, subsetting is a potential solution to this problem because you can choose to only limit the range of characters that are being provided to your users. And there are numerous applications, both, on, both online and offline, that allow you to do this, like the ones that I've kind of listed here. There are also font services like Monotype and Typekit, which offer this option called dynamic subsetting, where font files are served with only the glyphs needed on each page. The thing is, these solutions have limitations. For example, you might lose open type features during subsetting. There'll also be caching issues because you're requesting new font files for every page. So it's a very tricky problem. Now, variable fonts are, I would call it, a re relatively recent uh, development. But variable fonts allow a single font file to contain all the styles and weights that a designer intends, you know, via variation axes, right? And developers actually can access these options via CSS, as I've done here. So, in the grand scheme of things, sending a single font file to users does yield a lot of performance benefits as opposed to what we've been doing now, because the overall size of font files is reduced and fewer file requests are being made. However, this doesn't really alleviate the original problem which CJK character sets face. But we could potentially be seeing some breakthroughs in the near future. Currently, there's an industry-wide collaboration between Adobe, Apple, Google, Monotype, and Mozilla, plus a couple of type foundries and software vendors who are trying to resolve the issues that I described earlier. In order to tackle the limitations of current font upsetting strategies, this web font performance super collab is working on a solution that allows for the subsetting of a font request to only what is required on the page. But the difference here being it will progressively add on to the original font request for subsequent pages. So this is a prototype of the concept in action on this incremental transfer demo that was done by the Google Fonts team. So as text is continually added from different scripts, no less, you can see there's a vast difference between what we do today and what could be possible in the future. Because the savings are actually quite significant and much closer to the optimal subset than what any of our current implementations can achieve today. So Jason Palmental, who is a web topography expert and invited expert to the W3C Web Fonts Working Group, wrote about this incremental font transfer demo in his newsletter, Web Topography News, so I suggest following him for updates and subscribing to his newsletter if web fonts, web topography is your thing. Now, the medium we're operating is the web. Then our tool for the trade of typesetting is naturally CSS. So we're trying to do what folks have been doing since setting type became a thing. It's just that our tools have changed over time, right? So the most basic thing is to declare a content language on the element. So what this does is it identifies the specific written form of the language to be used in your content. And the browser needs to know this. This is very inf important information because language and writing system conventions affect a lot of typographic effects that are out the box with the browser. For example, things like line breaking, hyphenation, justification, and so on. So for CSS, these language specific tailorings are only applied when content language is explicitly declared. So naturally, it's in our best interest to tell the browser exactly what language our content is in to ensure a higher quality typographic experience for the users. So open type fonts can include an expanded character set and layout features. And this gives us much broader linguistic support and more precise typographic control. 
So this is also a big plus for multilingual typography, uh, and but as it allows you know multiple language character cells to be rendered within a single font. Now for the most part, CSS today provides developers a lot more granular typographic control as compared to the early days. So there are CSS properties for adjustments at the character level, at the line level, and even at, and also at the layout level, right? So font feature properties are what gives developers this access to a variety of open type features, things like swashes, ligatures, old style numerals, and there are also a number of language specific features. And we toggle them as developers with CSS so long as the font supports them. So to that point, font metrics are very important. They are measurements of characters in a font, and computers, browsers, you know, use these to determine how to lay out characters on the line. So things like spacing between lines, positions of sub and superscripts, etc. But font metrics aren't really mandatory, and sometimes type designers don't include them in the fonts. And this does make it quite hard for CSS, or like browsers in general, to figure out what to do. This applies for all open, open type features, not just font metrics per se. But when fonts do have these features, we can do a lot of interesting things by CSS. There's one particular font variant property for East Asian uh, text, for example, that allows us to control glyph substitution and positioning for Han characters. So here it's set to traditional. I can change it to simplified. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's a difference in the fonts being rendered, but it, it, it's the same run of text. It's just a different glyph, right? And there's also some for Japanese because they have different industrial standards. So th this is a pretty specific font variant. And there's also language related CSS properties like this font language overwrite. Because like I mentioned, browsers and user agents, they refer to the language attribute to determine what language the content is in. But let's say a font that you're using doesn't lack support for the language. Uh, in this example, I'm using Macedonian. So the text is written in Macedonian, but the font that I've chosen doesn't have the necessary typographic tailorings for Macedonian. However, if the font contains the characters for Serbian, which share similar characteristics, we can actually trigger those characteristics, but yet still let the browser know that the language of the content itself is still Macedonian using this font language override property. Other than font feature CSS properties, other text related CSS properties also have quote unquote language awareness. And sometimes these include values that most people maybe are not aware of. Text transform is a relatively common property being used, uh, usually used for text uh, capitalization and case adjustments. but this property does take into account language specific case mapping rules. So if I change this to uppercase, our German speaking friends will be very familiar with this. Um, but you can see that the German as it becomes a double S in uppercase or like the Greek vowels will lose their accents when the entire word is uppercase. So things like that, the browser is pretty smart about. And then there are also values that are very specific to certain uh, languages. For example, there's a Ruby is used I think exclusively in East Asian languages. So there is a value called full size kana that is applicable when we are typesetting Japanese texts. This is mostly used for Ruby annotations. And there's also the text emphasis property. Um, Chinese writing does not have italic styles. So to emphasize words, we use a particular type of punctuation called zhuo zhong hao. And we can use CSS for this using this text emphasis property and the value we would use is a dot so we emphasize it via a dot but because italics em triggers italics for uh, alphabetic uh, languages we can also make use of a language pseudo class to kind of make these micro adjustments for different languages within the same line of text now, text justification is also fairly tricky on the web. And whether we realize it or not, most of us would have encountered at least two major justification algorithms. We have the greedy algorithm, which analyzes only a single line, and a much more advanced Nuth Plus algorithm, which analyzes every line in a paragraph. So design software with advanced typesetting capabilities like InDesign use Nuth Plus. 
Browsers sadly use the simple one, uh, probably for performance reasons, I think. But although we don't have robust justification algorithms on the web, the CSS text level 3 does include text justify to allow some further tweaking of justified text, and this is very relevant for East Asian text. If I just search for text justify web on Google, this is the top result. It says don't use fully justified text alignment on your website. The next on the list, justify text with HTML, CSS, don't do it. So it seems like justified text has quite a bad rep on the web, but this might be true for Latin based scripts, but not so much for Chinese characters because, or at least just Han characters, square based characters, right? Because square characters are composed within this uniform square. So Hangul or Japanese characters, we all exist, each character exists within this uniform square that can be typeset into neat rows and columns. In fact, it is ideal to line them up neatly. But when there are both Latin-based alphabets and Chinese characters, it's, it's kind of impossible for everything to line up really nicely. So the next best thing we can do is to ensure that the start and end of every line is aligned properly. So adjustments like these can be made between adjacent typography character units in Chinese text or in, in square character text, for example, with the inter just inter character property and again this is a uh, this is a property that's still being being discussed as well but is already implemented in firefox and of course writing systems they're not limited to horizontal top to bottom traditionally east asian languages are written vertically arabic and hebrew written from right to left many different directions Broad support for vertical writing on the web was actually a relatively recent development, so somewhere post-2050. So what it does, writing mode, is, is really very specific to vertical writing, right? So the default being horizontal top to bottom, but we can easily change the direction to vertical nowadays using vertical RL or LR. There's even a sideways option, but this has been moved to level 4, I believe. Firefox has it, so we can kind of see it in action right now. And of course, while we rotate lines of text, this is going to affect the individual characters within the line as well. Thankfully, browsers are smart enough to tell that, and this is based on Unicode, right? Browsers are smart enough to tell that Chinese characters, which are dual direction, will always be displayed upright, no matter how the lines are, are rotated. Horizontal only languages, English, German, etc., will have their characters rotated because, you know, it doesn't make sense to read them vertically. So we use text orientation to control this, so fairly granular control. And the last property in this suite is text combined upright. So this addresses the issue of numerals and abbreviations in vertical text. So very s common example would be dates. So if your text contains dates, you can fit all the digits into the width of one character and display all these characters upright. There is a last value uh, on the right it's called digits this has not been implemented in any browser but it kind of makes sense to have a limit on this sort of a property because if you see here four digits is is probably the maximum you can push in such a tiny space if you do nine it looks very uncomfortable 13 is just ridiculous so probably makes sense to have some limits here and even though vertical text is better suited for east asian languages when it comes to full length body copy that doesn't mean other languages can't get in on the fun. Uh, we can use vertically set text in print, so why not on the web? Now, I mean, things like headers or short runs of text could always be typeset, you know, vertically for some variety, I would say, in layout. You could also combine writing mode with other, tran with other CSS properties, so just to make the layout more interesting on the web, right? So if we do something like this, or we could like rotate text as well, there are so many options and so many combinations that are available with these new properties, right? Now, even though the web can display all kinds of content, dynamic or otherwise, everything is essentially rectangles, or we can call them boxes, right? There are many, many different kinds of boxes and they interact with each other in different ways, but fundamentally, the web is boxes. So there are issues with lay laying, laying out things on the web, with, with typography on the web. For example, here we have five inline boxes, right? So there's enough room across 
all five boxes so they fit in one single line box so line box is like a singular line everything is boxes my friends everything is boxes but let's say there isn't enough room so what happens is that inline boxes can be broken they can be bro broken across line boxes so now we have two line boxes two lines so this break is known as a line break in this example the lines were broken due to content wrapping so it's like a soft wrap break right so the user agent must minimize the amount of content overflowing a line by wrapping the line at a soft wrap opportunity, wherever it exists. So for most writing systems, soft wrap opportunities occur at word boundaries, where spaces or punctuation are used to explicitly separate words. However, there's a lot of nuance with how line breaking happens, because it works very differently depending on what language we're typesetting for. English always wraps its spaces, but for Japanese or Chinese characters, this line break is usually per character, but not all the time, because there are additional rules for line breaking. For example, certain line, line breaks are prohibited for certain punctuation characters, and a, a number of other, I would say, special cases, right? There are also Southeast Asian scripts, like Thai, which is written without spaces between words. So then text is wrapped at syllable boundaries in addition to word boundaries. And there's so many more cases as we talk about different languages, right? So with these four CSS properties, there is some interplay to provide developers more precise control over how the line should break. Because some rules take precedence over others if both are present. Some only take effect if white space allows wrapping, for example. It's not an easy problem to solve uh, at a technical level either. So until now, we've covered quite a bit, but there is still a long way to go when it comes to web typography. Because the, the box model, right? All these talk about boxes I was mentioning. The CSS line box model was invented in the 90s when technology was not as powerful as it is today. And typographies, typographers generally don't like the way CSS handles font sizes. And the CSS working group is working to fix things. They, they are, this is one of the areas of focus these days. They are thinking about rhythmic sizing and how to programmatically achieve a consistent vertical rhythm on the web where text is often interrupted by other types and sizes of content. They're thinking about how to deal with situations where different font families are being used, about situations where how should we support typographic features in writing systems that are not alphabetic. So there's a lot of work going on right now that's at the ideation phase because there's so many tricky problems to work out. But the good thing is that the CSS Working Group does all its work on GitHub, does it in the open, the discussions take place in the open. So any one of us, you and I, ideally font designers, can all chime in to specific issues, uh, all on GitHub, in public, right? So one of the problems that, that is being looked at is, is, we could call it the leading problem, right? CSS allocates leading based on the line height by line height value by but subtracting the ascent and descent from the specified line height because line height is a CSS property you can set right so it subtracts that splits the remainder in half and then gives each ha half to the top and the bottom respectively so this half letting thing is I would say a lot of typographers are very annoyed by this I think but doing so actually allows us to get decently even line spacing for the most part if your paragraph of text is of exactly the same font family. Now, when we have different font families on the same line, things don't line up as well because different fonts have different ideas of what the font size should be. For example, this, this is an illustration whereby 1M or the, the, the font size is exactly the same, but everyone seems to have a different idea of what the box size should be like. So what CSS does right now, right, the solution CSS does is to guarantee that content will never overlap at the expense of aesthetics. Because if you suddenly have a font that is much larger right in the middle of the text, the line box is just going to expand. But the CSS working group is trying to come up with a new algorithm to calculate this optimal line size. Again, under discussion, because it's so tricky, right? That's, that's why I mentioned earlier that font metrics are very important, because font metrics help a lot in terms of how the browser vendors, how the, the working group is going to come up with this algorithm. 
strict vertical rhythm tends to go out the window when we're trying to lay out many different types of content, right? So we can call this like the interruption problem where content is interrupting your text. But it is quite important when it comes to things like multi-column layouts where we have content side by side. Another tricky problem to solve, right? Because if your content is interspersed with the headings, block codes, and all this has different, I would say different heights, different box heights. So one of the proposed new properties, potential new properties is something called block step size, which sets the height of a line to be a multiple of the value def you define. But then there are also so many considerations, right? Like where should any extra space go? Do you put it in the margins? Do you put it in the paddings? And none of this has been, you know, resolved yet, right? All this is up in discussion. So the earlier thing that I was talking about with um, the line height, I think that's been discussed in the inlight layout model. This particular one is in the CSS rhythmic sizing module. So there's a lot of work being done and the specs are also being a sourcing for feedback which is why I'm mentioning them again and again that the work is being done on GitHub and that's what the CSS working group is also trying to solicit feedback from, from you know, typographers because this is essentially, this is for them, is to make their lives better, right? So there's a lot more granular detail about the things that I covered about the specs that I listed out earlier. So there's this talk by Elika Atamat at CSS Day. Uh, she goes into a lot of detail because she is the editor for many of the specs that I did list above, so I recommend this video as well. As we close off this talk, I'd like to circle back to the idea I mentioned at the start about the origins of digital technology. Right now we're living in a digital age, a world running on computers, and these computers were pioneered in the West in countries that use an alphabetic, left to right oriented writing system. This is an irreversible first mover advantage because less than a century later, everyone in the world, regardless of their native writing system, is more or less used to a left to right, top to bottom orientation for digital content. This is not a criticism, it's merely an observation. Vertical writing systems like Chinese, Japanese and Korean went horizontal as Western science and technology prevailed. Even so, I cannot help but wonder if somewhere along the timeline, something had changed. If the Islamic Golden Age prevailed or if the Ming Dynasty never closed China's doors. What sort of a world would we live in, and what systems would we be using? That being said, I'm glad that there are active efforts in improving the support of more languages and writing systems in the digital realm, and hopefully this provides greater opportunities for people from different backgrounds and cultures to share their perspectives and have their voices heard on a bigger scale than before, and to also allow their text, their culture, and their content to be shared with the rest of the world as it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, who knows? There might be some alternate reality out there. I mean, there are theories about that, that we don't live in just one, but in a plentitude, <laughs> many copies of ourselves. So it would be, who yeah, it would be fun, uh, kind of a fun thought experiment <laughs> to, to think about that. Uh, yeah, we have uh, one, one question from the audience. Um, what is the current status of progressive font enrichment? I think it's going to be super useful for loading fonts on the web. Yeah, I think so from from where I'm set, I ever since that presentation that I heard from Jason uh, Pamento's newsletter, there hasn't seemed to be much further um, development but as i suppose as with most specification level things um it takes time because priorities i think they change so i think that's that's a, that's the latest that we've got so far so i th uh, with a lot of these things it all boil it all boils down to who's pushing for it harder mm. um so at the time, there was quite a bit of traction and it kind of died down a little. So hopefully, uh, if, if enough people see this and are reminded that this was a thing, uh, some interest might, you know, come back up. But it's definitely something I would really, really like to see because it's so critical for any CJK language website who wants to use fonts that are beyond the system set. Mm. 
Um, I mean, I do appreciate that Windows and Mac, they have, with the late newer operating systems, added more fonts. But if we compare it to most of the other languages, uh, we, we kind of have a very slim selection, I think. Yeah. Yes, of course. So let's uh, let's hope that uh, the appropriate uh, institutions and and people will uh, catch up here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do we have any other questions? I just have a quick look. Perhaps um, could you quickly uh, explain to us this idea of the intrinsic web design? Ah, uh, so. I first heard this term from Jen Simmons, who is, I would say, fairly well known uh, in the web, develop web design, web development circle. Yeah. So she's done so much excellent work. She's now with Apple uh, as, a, as a web kit advocate. I think it's a perfect role for her. And her take on it is something that I, I very much agree with in that the, the, basically, the idea is around really embracing right, the web as a medium that is different from print. And intrinsic web design, I think it, it kind of boils down to content, right? Like, and, and the fact that we have a number of newer CSS properties that really kind of are uh, unique to the web. Like they're not trying to mimic something that we already had on print, which was what we used mm -hmm. to have. Um, I feel that the, the, newer, the newer CSS properties that we have are, are kind of really making use of the advantages of a digital medium like the web browser. And I think when she mentioned, and when we talk about intrinsic web design, I think what, what the emphasis is it's like it's not a it's not a it's not like a checklist of hard and fast rules, but rather it's kind of a mindset around how you get your content to to display well. And it's slightly different from responsive design in the sense that responsive design is still a bit how should we put this? It's like prescriptive. Like the developer mm. has to give very specific instructions to what the, the page should look like. But I think with intrinsic web design, it's more of a like, things like Flexbox or like Grid, they're, it's predicated on the browser being able to do these calculations just based on hints that we give hmm. them. So mm -hmm. like, we're not explicitly yeah. saying that, oh, you have to be this size. It's rather that you, you're telling the browser like, if we're giving the browser a range of options, we're like, it be between this size and this size, but you know, you figure it out because you know how much space you have, or like things like that. So, so I think that's more. Of, I think that's that's my interpretation of it. Is is that we have much better tools now, much a much better instruction set mm -hmm. to tell the browser what to do. So, so in my mind, it's like the browser is growing up like the browser used to be a toddler or you're like sit down here and eat your food whatever <laughs> but like the browser is now like a i don't know has grown just up got its driver's license, has grown up right <laughs> so you can just give it more like give it just guidelines and can you can mm -hmm. trust that the browser knows what to do now okay uh, and I, I so think yeah that's 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 my analogy that's, uh Let's let's try to do that. Let's trust the browsers, <laughs> hopefully without too many yeah, breaks. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll see you later at the panel. Mm. Looking forward to that.